My name is Angus Kennedy from the Institute of Ideas. I also chair the Institute of Ideas uh, Economy Forum, which helped produce this session uh, and quite a few others on the economy this weekend. A, a focus on development uh, has been on the agenda for a long time now since um, Amartya Sen uh, put it really at the center of thinking uh, for the UN back in um, 1990, arguing that we should put people back at the center of things in the development process and not focus entirely on uh, material measures. And I think you can see reflected, or, or certainly I find reflected in a lot of contemporary discussions about justice, that when we use, use the word development, uh, we're talking about improving the lives of the poor uh, more than we are talking about uh, building factories or nuclear power stations. Development seems to have that sense these days. And when we talk about prosperity, uh, it's often with a sense of embarrassment uh, about the word, that the existence of prosperity seems to be in the hands of few and shines a rather embarrassing light on the many who don't have it. And there's been a long uh, discussion around those themes over the last 20 years, and it's part of what we want to explore today. And it's very much of the moment. Issues of justice and fairness and equality are being very much discussed in Britain in the context of the uh, comprehensive spending review uh, we've just had, issues like the proposed withdrawal of child benefit or increases in university tuition fees and who should bear the cost of cuts. David Cameron holds forth a vision of a big society to fix a broken society and to bring social justice to us. He's determined, he says, to change the way in which we live. Nicholas Sarkozy, too, who commissioned an important report uh, out this summer involving Amartya Sen, writing for it, and uh, Joseph Stiglitz, wrote an interesting preface to the introduction in which he demands a revolution in the ways in which we think and in, way in which we act, and says, there are injustices improprieties, acts of folly that in future will no longer be tolerable and will not be tolerated, which is a rather uh, frightening message uh, from the French uh, Prime Minister, if you like. But it does set out um, the reality of this debate and the importance that we have it today, whether we think that objective measures like GDP, statistics that are often decried as being arid, uh, idealized model building, uh, and the world of theory, on the one hand, can they help us understand justice, or on the other, should we focus on felt injustices, uh, the more subjective approach, uh, happiness, are we uh, the measures of our well-being, people's actual lives in the world, and what we can do in terms of setting out uh, to improve them. So there's kind of, there's kind of the th themes that we'd like to reflect on and explore, and I think we might also think about justice itself and what kind of institutions uh, might administer justice, and what standards we might use to make judgments in the world. So my panel then, in the order in which they're going to speak, on my left, I'm very pleased that we have Stuart Wallace here. Stuart is the Executive Director of the New Economics Foundation. Uh, he's a long career in business and with the World Bank, after which he joined Oxfam in 1992 as the International Director, ending up having responsibility for about 2,500 staff in 70 countries, and all of Oxfam's policy, research, development, and emergency work worldwide, um, leading to him being awarded the OBE uh, for services to Oxfam in 2002, and he's the author of A Radical New Vision for World Trade. Uh, next up on my right here is Anil Gupta. Anil is the professor at the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. He's the founder of the Honeybee Network, uh, which looks to demonstrate the potential of uh, knowledge-rich but economically poor people in developing societies, uh, ways in which they can take those societies out of uh, what he calls a morass of mediocrity uh, and lead them on a path of uh, sustainable progress. On my immediate right, following Anil, is uh, Bruno Waterfield. He's a, a bit of a regular at the Battle of Ideas. He's the Brussels correspondent uh, for the Daily Telegraph since 2006. Uh, before that, he was part of the founding editorial team of epolitics.com. Uh, he's written a, a pamphlet, a book called No Means No, uh, a reflection on the uh, no votes in the Lisbon referendum. And he's a big fan of George Orwell, uh, which I think is a good thing to be bringing into this session today. So after Bruno, on my far right, Anne Bernstein, who's the executive director of the Center for Development uh, and Enterprise in South Africa. She's just published a new book called The Case for Business in Developing Economies, 
reflecting on the huge amount of regulation that can often stand in the way of entrepreneurship and the growth that she believes is required for uh, developing economies to uh, raise the living standards of everybody in these economies. She's a, a leading world expert on development uh, and a pol policy analyst. And finally, my far left, Sabina Alkira. Sabina is the director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, something very much uh, inspired by Amartya Sen's work. She researches multidimensional poverty measurement and analysis, welfare economics, and the capability approach, how we might measure questions of freedom and human development. She's written a, an important book on that called Valuing Freedoms, Sen's Capability Approach uh, and Poverty Reduction, and she's currently working uh, on developing more uh, measures to help us uh, try and understand some of these areas. I want to focus on economic justice and use that as an example to talk about the wider issues of social justice. And I want to talk about the foundations of what's the generally accepted economic system that operates in large parts of the world, because I want to argue that that is both intellectually and morally bankrupt. Why? Well, because if you lift your head a bit, and it's difficult in this country at the minute, from the very difficult situation we're in with the cuts and all the suffering that goes with that, but and the arguments about whether it's necessary or not. I don't want to get into that. I want to look at the systemic problems we're facing in the, the wider economy. And I want to argue there are four systemic problems. And they're systemic and they're interrelated. The first is, put simply, we're running out of planet. And that's a function not just of growing population, but even probably more excess consumption. And when you look at almost any dimension, you look at what's happening on climate change and the serious risk of getting runaway climate change beyond two degrees from pre-industrial levels. When you look at ecosystems, and there's just been this very interesting meeting in Japan this last week on biodiversity, but ecosystems, some 15 out of 25 of the core ecosystems on which life support bits, uh, systems the planet depend, are in decline, some very seriously, some less so. But that runs across fresh water, it runs across uh, pollination systems, amount of topsoil we've got. We are seriously, for the first time in our history, running out of planet. And that really alters things very fundamentally. The second and interrelated issue is inequality. And it's a less known, well, well known fact that at the beginning of the 20th century, the ratio of the poorest 20% on the planet to the richest 20% was roughly somewhere between 5 to 1 and 10 to 1. Nobody's quite so sure. At the end of the 20th century, it was 75 to 1. So we've seen a serious increase at global level in inequality levels. And that obviously applies at the much more local level as well. Last year, the 1.6% of Londoners who earned over £200,000 a year took 25% of the total London income. So we're looking at serious levels of inequality. And globally, the, the richest 1% uh, in the world have as much income as the poorest 57%. Now, there's been lots of recent work on that, looking at the effects of um, inequality, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, the spirit level, for example, arguing that actually inequality as well as poverty is a serious driver of social ills, and in some cases even more so. So that's the second issue, and it relates to the first issue because if we wanted to grow, have everybody in the world, it's a poor measure, but if you want everybody in the world to have $3 a day or $1,000 a year, and you kept income distribution as it is now and the resource intensity of output as it is now, you need 15 planets to get there. So we've got a serious problem when you look at ecological resources and, in, and distribution. The third problem, terribly quickly, is resilience. We've designed an economic system for efficiency rather than resilience. Ecosystems are usually both. As a result, it's neither resilient or efficient, and you've seen that in the collapse of what happened with the housing market in the US and then rippling through the global economic system. And the last is for some people on the planet, and I mean stress some, more and better are part of company. More income is not translating into better lives. That's not true if you're poor, 
if you're in many parts of the world, but for significant people on the planet, that is true. GDP has doubled over a 20-year period in the UK. Well-being has flatlined. Now, the point is, if you put all those things together, we're running faster and faster to not make ourselves any happier, consuming a lot of the planet's resources, and putting ourselves at serious risk of another collapse and certainly ecological collapse. So we're pretty stupid in that sense. Now you could go into, I haven't got time to go into the why, there's a lot of economics is built on a whole range of myths um, and half truths, some of which have never really been true, some of which are ceasing to be true because of running up against planetary limits. That's perhaps for questions, we can go back into that. But the intellectual base is bankrupt, but I want to argue it's morally bankrupt as well. Adam Smith, as well as the wealth of nations, also wrote the theory of moral sentiment. He was very much argued that the economics he was proposing only worked if people were moral actors. He also argued it only worked if um, and that nobody could affect the prices or enough people selling and buying, you couldn't affect prices. Neither are necessarily true. And we seem to have forgotten in our demand that just markets will answer things the moral point that Adam Smith made. But in addition, we're in a very different place now running up against planetary limits. Even if individual actions of myself or yourself or people who've got quite a lot in the world are ethical, their collective outcomes of them may not be ethical because we're consuming resources at the expense of other people in the world or at the expense of other generations. And therefore, the issue of how much is enough is a fundamental moral question in the world that we've got to start to address. And that's obviously in the richer countries of the world, but it's also about those consuming more in the poorer countries. So what is a fair share? And how do we deal with that? Well, I would argue there are ways through this conundrum. I think the rights framework, which I spent a lot of my life trying to promote, and social and economic rights have not been given nearly enough credence, I think the rights framework gives a very good baseline of what every single person should have. But it doesn't help us address those issues of too much. And we need some other frameworks to do that. And similarly, the utilitarian, you know, neither the utility theory of what's best for the largest number of people is the answer. That doesn't work very effectively, nor does even the more advanced rights framework of individual rights and freedoms. We've actually got to start to develop a dialogue about what is right. And there isn't simple answers. I mean, we would argue from New Economics Foundation, we've done a lot of work on something called Great Transition, arguing what a different world in the UK would look like. And there we're arguing for that there are ways through this where you could increase human well-being, reduce inequality, and live within planetary limits. And we've done this book, The Great Transition. Lots of things there. I can say much more about it. And even the principles that would underlie that. But it's, that's my principles. That may or may not be the right principles. The issue is we need to have the debate. And these things are left in the realm of economics without us really unearthing what's happening. And I think there's three questions, because justice in the end requires judgment. Three questions that need to be asked. What is possible in ecological limits? What's possible in planetary limits? What's good? And that gets back to these moral questions. And for whom? And we've got to address those three questions. And we've got to particularly ask the most powerful in society, how much is it right for you to take in salary? How much is it? What's the underlying basis on which you can argue that's good for society? So we need to start having that debate. In a world of limits, we've got to have that moral debate, and we've got to come to conclusions amongst ourselves on it. Thank you. The best way to pay tribute to a scholar, to a statesperson, is to critique his or her ideas. And I thought that Amit Sen, who has had such a great influence on all of us, me included, and whose thoughts on justice have influenced several of the panelists sitting here, deserves, the, out of the respect that I have for him, a reasonably strong critique of his framework. The whole concept of capability that he voiced with the right intentions missed one of the most fundamental capability that human mind 
ever had, has, and will have. And this is the capability to imagine. Capacity to imagine, capability to implement or pursue that imagination into action, capability for innovations. Not one word in the entire discourse of Sain and the followers of Sain is about how knowledge-rich economically poor people could use their imagination to solve the problems of unfair distribution of resources and unequal access to the opportunities for exploiting whatever little resources they have. I've spent the last three decades essentially proving the point and now uh, building a value chain around the knowledge in which poor, or the, the resource in which poor people are rich, that is their knowledge. And what is the implication of this? The implication is, at one level, we talk about knowledge economy is the economy of future. So we know so much, we feel about this much, and we act only this much. This is for all of us. It is a truism to say that it cannot be a rectangle, so it's a triangle, it's a inverted pyramid. But maybe we can change the dimension of this pyramid. The problem arises when the knowledge in which poor people are rich does not get resonated with the public policy, with the institutions that we create, with the culture that we have around us, and therefore get bypassed in the systems of articulation. There's one more dimension to that, in which is, in the last uh, decade and a half when India has started growing, many people have not noticed that during the same period, the number of districts which have very high insurgency have also grown. So we have about one-fifth of our country affected by insurgency and violence of a very high order. And these are the regions which are rich in natural resources. So we looked at the neglect of the mental resources, we look at now the exploitation of the natural resources, and we begin to see how it breeds violence. Violence because people feel that they have been taken for granted. So what kind of justice this is in which you will sap all the articulated leadership because it voices dissent and leave the room for maneuver only for those people who are willing to talk your language. So there's a great crisis to my mind in the discourse on justice because we are not understanding probably enough as to how people try to seek justice in their everyday life. Let me illustrate. When this Honeybee Network started and I have kept some of the magazines on the back side so you could pick up, some of the CDs are on your table, on the chairs. Look around and you will notice that no matter what aspect of life it is, women, millions of women carrying water on their head. So there's a pain in the neck and on the back. With all the technology institutions in the world and with all the scientists that we have, we wouldn't be able to see how the load from the head is transferred to some other part of the body so that drudgery is reduced. An innovator comes across, Kim Ji Bhai, and he says, well, wait a minute, I could have a ring which rests on the shoulder instead of on the head lifts the load about half a centimeter and transfers the load to the shoulder. So I have not removed your drudgery, but I have reduced it. You will not have pain in the neck. You will not have pain in the back. Even small steps like this, which can provide some succor to the people who are economically poor and knowledge rich, goes a long way in giving them hope that the future can belong to them. So my contention is that three of the basic premise which guided us to, to create or to evolve the Honeybee Network are valid even today. The first premise was cross-pollination, encouraging people-to-people -people knowledge transfer, which can only take place in local languages. Go to the net and try to find the content on the net about innovations and knowledge of the common people. And you will be surprised that even after 20, 25 years of Honeybee Network, there still is not much content in local languages from different parts of the world which demonstrates examples of people overcoming their constraints. Isn't it a great black box? Second, you will also notice that there's very little acknowledgement in the scholarship, in the publications of the creativity of the people. So we don't respect their knowledge rights, we don't respect their resource rights, and we don't respect their right to convert their knowledge into enterprises. So that you have microfinance all over the world. Have you ever heard about microventure finance? Never. Never, not once. So all the world banks and the Asian Development Banks and the European Development Bank, whatever banks that you have in the world, will provide microfinance 
for the people and that too for the women, microfinance, men, micro, microfinance. But no, micro, no venture finance. So if risk is the crucial factor which converts opportunities into accessibility, then this risk-taking ability is not available. So in the Honeybee Network, we try to provide, set up a micro venture finance to be able to overcome this constraint where people have ideas, people have imagination, but they do not have the wherewithal to convert imagination into action, into the solutions. So let me conclude by saying that the model that we have developed recognizes violence as a last resort of the people who have been neglected and bypassed. And my contention is that if we did not pay attention to the issues of social justice for the people who deserve a chance under the sun, we will have even more violence, more anomaly, and that is not going to lead to the peace and order. So violence should not be seen as an aberration. It should be seen as an act of expression of the people who have lost patience with our public policy pronouncements about how justice will be delivered. The last point, there are 250 million people below poverty line in our country who are given 100 days of employment. To do what? To dig earth, break stones, but not to use their mind to create enterprises around their innovations. Now, this is the worst indictment of the SANES framework where government becomes the patron and the arbiter of justice with the tool that it has, which is to keep people engaged somehow, not let them die, and that is it. If that is the only justice that we are going to dispense, future will not belong to people who will then snatch the future from our hands by using means which will not be very fair to many of us, but which is what they are left with. Thank you. Probably fatally, um, given the time constraints, I want to frame what I say today by starting with two different very different responses to injustice using other people's words. I want to start with His Royal Highness for, for Prince of Wales, and an account taken from his new book, which is just out, called Harmony. Part of the book is Prince Charles's um, reaction um, to Dirave, a slum in uh, Mumbai that has become something of a playground for those like the heir to the British throne who are looking for a new way of looking at a world, a new way of looking at these issues about growth is best, etc. I quote, when you enter what looks from the outside like an immense pile of plastic and rubbish, you immediately come upon an intricate network of streets with miniature shops, houses and workshops, each one made of any material that came to hand. I'm sure, having seen this elsewhere, that such a layout comes from a kind of intuitive patterning. A sacred geometry, says Charles Windsor, that is inherent in all mankind but a natural pattern of humanity, he claims, that has been disrupted by Western ideology. He goes on. Many observers of communities, such as Derive, writes for Prince, quickly note the absence of physical assets, such as power, water, and sanitation, rather than the presence of an immensely important but less tangible element of community capital. The temptation, he continues, is to see their material poverty rather than the rich complexity and diversity that holds the community together despite such trying and uncomfortable circumstances. To see deprivation rather than how order has naturally emerged. Moreover, the Prince proclaims, not only are the slum dwellers of Derive more in harmony with natural patterns, but the voracious consumers of modern cities, people like us, have something to learn from them. In many countries, he writes, there continues to be an intense discussion about the rights and wrongs of municipal waste collection and how best to achieve recycling targets. But the people of Derive manage to separate all their waste at home, and it gets recycled without any official collection facilities at all, he writes, very approvingly. Now, am I the only one here to feel uncomfortable um, with this outlook. I do hope not. I would like to contrast, contrast this right royal view with an encounter George Orwell had over 60 years ago in a slum in the northwest of England. The writer in his 1937 book, The Road to Wigan Pier, describes a train journey out of Manchester, a voyage through, quote, a monstrous scenery of slag heaps and the slums of Longsight on a bitterly cold, sleety, dreary day. I quote, at the back of one of the houses, a young woman was kneeling on the stones, poking a stick up a leaden waste pipe, which ran from the sink inside and which I suppose was blocked. I had time to see everything about her. Her sacking apron 
her clumsy clogs, her arms reddened by the cold. She looked up as the train passed, and I was almost close enough to catch her eye. She had a round, pale face, and it wore, for the second I saw it, the most desolate, hopeless expression I had ever seen. It struck me then that we are mistaken when we say it isn't the same for them as it would be for us, and that people bred in the slums can imagine nothing but the slums. For what I saw in her face was not the ignorant suffering of an animal. She knew well enough what was happening to her, understood as well as I did how dreadful a destiny it was to be kneeling there in the bitter cold on the slimy stones of a slum backyard poking a stick up a foul, foul drain pipe. Hold these two views and impressions in your mind. The first, Prince Charles, who finds in the slum a glimpse of a preferred destiny for mankind. The second, Orwell, who shared the universal impulse of humans to recoil at such a fate. Charles sees a kind of justice amid the deprivation in harmonious living. Orwell sees injustice in poverty's imposition of a miserable fate or destiny on a human being. Windsor's view is very much part of a mainstream culture war against economic growth and the char and characteristics of humanity, the attributes and principles that have driven social progress. The crusade takes the superficial form of a campaign against using a gross domestic product, Angus referred to it at the beginning, or GDP as a measure of human achievement um, or welfare, but it's really about reorientating um, society away from using economic growth as a marker of progress. So what's wrong with it? And bear in mind these two impressions that I've just given you. Amartya Sen, the Indian economist and thinker, rightly observes that famines, where people starve and die, are only an injustice if they could have been prevented. So if in primitive societies, because of natural circumstances, you have a famine, there's nothing anyone can do about it. It's not an injustice. On this basis, the Derive slum is an injustice by its very existence because it is surrounded by booming Mumbai. Something better can be done. It is being done there. Derive is an injustice. It's preventable. It is not a fate set by nature or anybody else. To trump it, as Charles does, its sacred geometry is to celebrate deadly arrangements where there is only one toilet per 1,440 residents with all the squalor and disease that comes without um, sanitation. Charles, Sarkozy and the rest of the Nobel Prize winning Beyond GDP Brigade value the particular harmonious community capital of slum societies that are said to bring well-being despite the deprivation. These values are seen as equally virtuous um, to growth. Much is made of such values, the belief, that, which must always be respected, but as Sen puts it, people in slums have a kind of life they have reason to value. People's ability to survive is in turned into more, a more or less explicit valuation of slum life. This replaces judgment by the principle of equality, which would mean that the operational standards of modern cities are better because all humans, bar a few cranks, would rather live there. Economic growth may not make us any happier than a slum dweller, or so they say, but increased production provides greater wealth and increased means to develop new ends for human beings. Economic growth is the expansion of possibilities. It is the reality on which we can imagine new things because new, product, uh, new, uh, new things are coming into the world. The expansion of possibilities provides us with instruments to defy fate, to change destinies. These are not beliefs or mere values, but universal principles that give a real alternative to fate, the destiny for example, of the misery that comes from poor sanitation, whether it is the woman in long sight or a disease in derive. Well, no, I'm, I'm very happy to follow on from that talk. I think we're on the same wavelength. I come from a country, South Africa, where some 38% of the labor force is unemployed, where some eight million people live in what we politely call informal settlements, really shacks, and what some 50% of the population live in poverty. 
It's my view that the most important issue facing the country is jobs, jobs, and more jobs, uh, and more economic growth. There's a hidden battle of ideas that's taking place about the role of business in society. And you see it in many different ways and the way in which people talk. Um, and that's really what my book is about. I am in favor of more business in developing countries, not less. And in some respects, the debate about development and the definition of development has been captured by people who don't really like economic growth, um, who sit in some of the richest countries in the world often, and don't really appreciate the dynamics of growth that have got them into a hall like this and a whole range of other things. And somehow they think this isn't quite the way to go. Whereas poor people have very few resources and very few options. I certainly agree they know a lot more than people credit them with. They know how to build informal houses, which I certainly don't, and they keep them a lot cleaner than my house. But that anyone can doubt. They want a better life, and the kind of life that I think everyone in this room takes for granted is, to my mind, quite simply missing the point. Now, I, I think in many places in the West, the notion of a good company is one that is defined by activists and some governments and authors living in those rich countries. And very seldom are voices from developing countries heard or listened to. And if you think of the debates about you know, conditions in, in factories in Asia or other countries, this debate comes very prominently to the fore. Now, South Africa is a country where, for historic reasons, in the fight against apartheid, we adopted the world's best standards. We have what you might call former West German labor standards, the very highest in the world. We have a trade union movement with very high degree of organization, and they have fought for all sorts of standards. And in many ways, you're seeing the playing out of the global debate about global labor standards or environmental standards, you're seeing it in South Africa. And I was recently struck by an instance of this, which I think is very telling. There's a town in Natal, South Africa, which is, uh, has an unemployment rate in the town and surrounding areas of about 80%, particularly women. And an enterprising official managed to get some Chinese garment companies to come and set up there. And a lot of them are paying below the minimum wage. And the union alerted the inspectors, and the inspectors arrived to close down these factories. And listen to what the New York Times reporter reports from this incident. The women in the factories jumped on the tables, and they said to the inspectors, go away. We need and we want these jobs. Now, these are jobs I'm sure most of you wouldn't want. They're not great, not great conditions, not great pay, but they're the very best option available for these people. And you can participate in a conversation in London, Brussels, New York, Washington, where it is totally taken for granted that global labor standards are good for the poor and developing countries, and they're not. The fact is that the alternative to low-paying jobs is not high-paying jobs, it's no jobs at all. So if one starts the conversation about business and development with negative presumptions and faulty ideas, one ends up with more and more and more rules and regulations about how business should behave in developing countries. On the other hand, if one starts with a positive approach to business and an appreciation of the risk-taking and precarious nature of enterprise, big, small, medium-sized, this leads to a focus on creating an environment in which competitive enterprises can flourish and to help build the wealth <coughs> innovation and social capital 
that makes nations great. In poorer countries then, the problem, the real problem, is not that companies are unethical, but that there are too few of them. Now let me hasten to add that so many of the demands laid at the door of business are often ones that the state should fix. I am a Democrat. I believe in government. I believe in the role of effective government. So I'm not saying that people shouldn't have the right to organize to better their conditions. I'm not saying that anything like that. Governments have a responsibility to create infrastructure and the right environment for, for enterprise to flourish. And that's actually the only way you're going to deal with poverty. Brazil's brought some 30 million people out of absolute poverty. India in the last 15, 20 years has brought 90 million people out of absolute poverty. And of course, China is just a stunning example of hundreds of millions of people. This isn't perfect, but it's the only foundation we know of to do this as quickly as possible. And then hopefully smart states can tax companies, can use their resources well to start build public infrastructure, improve education systems, and so on and so forth. I'll end there. The horizon was still. The farmer was out in his field. And then it was broken by a horse that was galloping very, very quickly. So naturally he called out, hey rider, where are you going? Don't ask me, the man replied over his shoulder. Just ask my horse. The story was told by a monk who then said to his Western visitor, this is your condition. You are pulled forward by forces beyond your control and you have lost a sense of what direction you are aiming for. I'd like to try to build on the presentations that have gone before me that I've found very, very interesting. Stuart Wallace reminded us of the problem of planetary resources, of inequality, of instability, and of the disconnect between material and social and spiritual life. Anil drew our attention to the strength, energy, and imagination of poor people and to interventions of venture capital or of cross-pollination, the sharing of ideas and inspirations that can support their agency. Bruno spoke of principles, the principles that can guide development and so it does not rely on fate, but tries, in a sense, to shape that fate. I'll speak of Anna in a moment. In a report which we released this Thursday by the Secretary General Enda Martia Sen in New York is the 20th year anniversary human development report. And it will reframe human development to echo these ideas. Previously, human development has been defined as expanding people's choice. But it will add two new dimensions to that definition. One, is empowerment, particularly for poor people and communities. And the second is principles, the different principles of responsibility, of distribution, of sustainability, including principles about which we disagree. But I will speak of the first, which is, in a sense, what are the capabilities we are to expand and link it to the measurement agenda. We disagree, as we have heard here, about the direction and the dimensions of life that we value and about the relative importance of different priorities. That's no surprise, we always will. But there may be an agreement that GDP per capita has not sufficiently guided a number of divergent patterns of life. Therefore, as somebody who is trying to work on trying to create measures that better match people's realities, I would suggest three contributions which are ongoing and which could, if well informed by debates like this, 
shape future generations and policies, not only at the international level in centers of power, but also in local communities and in businesses and meso institutions. The first is to make better measures, multidimensional measures, perhaps. We released a multidimensional poverty index, which it forms part of this year's human development report. And it includes direct measures of deprivation like malnutrition, water, and sanitation. For these are actually not captured by income necessarily. The accuracy of income varies very much depending on the country context and whether the services are provided by government or not. So measures that look at the multiple disadvantages that batter a person's life at the same time are needed so that we understand what aspects to address. But second, what dimensions should we measure? What should go into new multidimensional measures, whether of poverty or of well-being? That, again, is an open question about which there is a great deal of disagreement. What we observed creating an international measure was the paucity of data. The data we have do not match what poor people and communities often describe to be their experiences of poverty. A woman in Brazil says, I am afraid they will kill my son for something as incidental as a snack. Yet for no country do we have data on violence alongside data on hunger and education and income. We also, to circle back to Anne's point, do not have data in international data sets that inform the MDGs on informal work, on the safety at work, or the meaningfulness of jobs that poor people, not people in formal sector employment, enjoy. We do not have data on disempowerment, nor on shame, humiliation, and isolation, and not even so much data on subjective well-being. So in a sense, in order to enrich the measurement agenda, we also have to look at how do we mediate between people's lives and experiences and quote unquote the numbers that policymakers can use and obtain data so that the measures can match people's experiences better. And the final aspect is interaction. We now live in a web 2.0 world, so it's easy at the international level we can put up data sets, as the UNDP has this week, and make them live so that you can adjust the Human Development Index. You can add the dimensions you think should be in it. You can change the weights. And this is one level to stimulate civil society debate in some sectors. But there are also other techniques. Local communities in the Philippines use a very participatory method of developing a indicator, but it's funded by the local government. And at the end, the local government officials can go to every house where there is a malnourished child and find out if the parents know about their programs. They can go to other households with other disadvantages and see the results of their work within their term of political office. So in a sense, the measurement agenda is only useful if it helps both to support debate and also to create clear instruments to take these kinds of discussions going. But finally, measurement is not the purpose. The purpose is change, and that needs a politics behind it. If you read about free market economics and the organization that they had behind the spread of that idea, you realize that most of it happened outside the academy with the media, the public intellectuals, an organization of how to strategically change the curriculum of economists and other institutions. And so having a wider strategy beyond just having small and locally valid ideas, but for creating changes beyond is also necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Even go panel. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, and I think that there's been a really excellent range of introduction there, and I want to bring you in as fast as possible. So I'm just going to ask a couple of questions myself to the panel, but I really just want your very quick responses just to get some things out there so we can think about them. And I'm just going to run along kind of in that order. Sabina, I mean, you just picked up a point that Sen makes that maybe the absence of material wealth isn't the best way of looking at, uh, at the problem, really, uh, that we should look at uh, capability deprivation. 
uh, instead because we all have uh, so many different kind of problems uh, in terms of maybe age, our, our different uh, physical abilities, gender and so on, that material income just can't meet those very different needs in the same ways. Uh, and you seem to be arguing that we should even uh, extend that thinking, if you like, that we should add more measures in to take account of that problem. Is there a sense in that that's you know, enriching that data and adding more measures and even kind of crowdsourcing it out through the internet, kind of add your own measure? Is a kind of abandonment of, of, of theory that it, we will end up with a position of everybody's individuated out? Is it, does it run the risk of becoming a refusal to make uh, judgments? I don't believe so, but I think it's a danger of, di of diffusion to be guarded against. Three responses. First, just to underscore, in a good quote from the idea of justice, Sen says, what tends to inflame the minds of a suffering humanity cannot but be of immediate interest to the diagnosis of injustice. And so, in a sense, the reaching out is necessary as an information gathering exercise. Second, um, Bhutan, for example, with its gross national happiness index, does have nine dimensions of well-being in the index, which do inform its policy, its project screening, and its programs, so are informing operational policy. And third, I think we will have to balance the diffusion and the centralization. We were just in OECD, which as a follow-up to Sarkozy Commission is considering creating a few quality of life indicators, and those could become, in a sense, the centerpieces for a multidimensional welfare economics. And yes, one would know national variations or local variations of them, but at least it would push the envelope out somewhat. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stuart, I mean, in your introduction, you talked about the kind of possibility or, or moral paradox, if you like, that individual actions can be ethical uh, within their own framework. But in the context of uh, resource limitations, uh, those actions can be collectively wrong. Is that an argument for reducing people's freedom? In the end, possibly yes. Certainly in terms of potentially reducing the amount that the very most fortunate on the planet consume. That's the, I mean, I think one thing we've got to be terribly careful of is not get into a false dichotomy on this. I would absolutely focus on jobs, on dealing with the issues in that slum, and I would absolutely support growth and say it's absolutely incredibly important for those who have not enough. But those who potentially are taking too much, we actually have to have the debate about how much we can all consume of the present of our current resources. And particularly, we're not very good at the moral debate between the most powerful and richest in the world and the poorest, but we don't begin to get anywhere when we talk about future generations. And I'm concerned about the morality of what we leave for future generations as well. And that is an ethical question, which will require restraint within <coughs> an ethical judgment. Okay, thank you. Bruno, I mean, very striking picture of Orwell having the bravery to look poverty in the face. What about uh, spiritual prosperity, though? I mean, do you discount that? I mean, there are aren't those same problems uh, in Britain or, or, of the poverty, I would argue, that Orwell saw, but is there a, an aspect that there is a, a degree of spiritual poverty that we should be aware of? I probably would see it um, slightly different. I don't think you know material prosperity is the be-all um, and end-all of um, life. I'm not one of those people who kind of witlessly um, celebrates um, consumption and the joys of iPods um, and mobile phones. But I do think that Orwell's response is a very, very human one. It's a very, very moral one because the struggle against, against fate is seen as the basis of equality. That means you must reach out to others, a sort of collective endeavour, politics that changes lives, the lives of people who reach out, the lives of people who are reached out to societies potentially makes history. I mean, unlike Prince Charles, Orwell is basically saying you should do as you would be done by. And in that kind of moral message and discipline and commitment that that forces upon you, I think there's far more 
potential for, for well-being, if you want to use those horrible words. So Orwell's glimpse, just a glimpse from the train, that spark of shared human identity in long sight set him on the life of pro progressive uh, engagement. He first saw that woman in February um, 1936. By December 1936, he was fighting in the Spanish Civil War um, alongside people who didn't want to bow to the fate of fascism. So I'm, I'm actually saying it, it is much more than material growth. It, it, it very much is um, about a whole notion of, of wider humanity and a, a, a moral commitment to other people. Uh, Anil, you talked about uh, Sen missing out, really, not talking about the capacity of poor and developing countries to transform their lives, to innovate. He doesn't talk much about in in invention. Is that capacity that they have enough, uh, or, or do they actually need uh, the kind of companies, more companies uh, that, that Anne was talking about to make that possible? Uh, let me first step back a minute and also say that one of the most disparaging terms that I have found in English language is unskilled laborer. I couldn't imagine a person anywhere, England, England included, who would have no skill whatsoever. In other words, if you ask a person on the street to break a light on the roof with a single stone throw, there'll be some people who will do that better than any one of us. Now, he could be led into archery or some other game or sport where that is what counts. That is the role of institution. That is the role of the state, to match the opportunities with the innate capability that people have. And this is where I'm saying Sain's framework falls. He has a uniform solution for a highly variegated, creative, diverse humanity, number one. Number two, yes, we do need enterprises, as I mentioned. Enterprises of various kinds. Cooperatives have become very unpopular today because you know, we only think of corporate. But there could be collective enterprises, there could be social enterprises, there could be individual enterprises. I would believe, I would, I'm very eclectic about this as to what form of enterprise will be appropriate can be determined. We got inquiries from 61 countries for the innovations that common people did on our website. Now imagine, 61 countries, there is a potential market for the solutions that people from our country are developing. So I'm sure similar opportunities will exist for people in Brazil, in South Africa, in UK, wherever there are innovators, their opportunities will be there. I think we have not thought through enough as to how the creative and entrepreneurial solutions can be found for poverty elevation, rather than statist employment in anything, no matter how demeaning that is. How can we all have taken a cup of tea? How many of us know how the tea leaves are plugged? Tea leaves are plugged like this from the bush, and the hand goes like in the back uh, basket. You do it 2,500 times, you do it 20 times, you will have pain in the shoulder. The lady does it 2,500, 3,000 times every day. Now that pain, we have no discomfort with. There is no moral question about how tea leaves are plugged because we enjoy our cup of tea. Now these questions which people have to live with every day and those that silence about these spaces, black spaces, black holes of innovation. Sometimes even people are not able to innovate some of the problems which affect women. I will be very candid that problems that women face are less likely to generate grassroots innovations than the problem that male face. There's a bias, it seems. Thank you. So, uh, Anne, just a final question before we, we go out. Stuart, I think in his introduction, might well have agreed with your point that um, we need more uh, companies and more development uh, in the poor countries in the world. But he, but he seems to be putting forth an argument that that might not be possible in the developed countries in the West. I mean, what's your position on more growth in the already rich countries? You made a very good case for it in the, the poor ones, but what about more growth in, in the West? Maybe development of tea picking machines. Well, the one point I would make when I was listening to Stuart is, you know, China decided they had too many people, so they introduced the one, ch one child policy and look at the inadvertent consequences of that. There are not enough girls in the society, the little princes, there are all sorts of positives, but there are a lot of negatives. On the other hand, India tried for a few short years, but generally didn't have this policy, a much more independent mind, democratic society. For years, people said, oh, too many people in India, how are we gonna feed them this and next thing? Now, people are saying, gee, India is going to have a demographic dividend. So I would just be very careful about interventions when you think you know what to do. I'm not in favor of that in general. Um, 
I mean, this is a very big debate about climate, about limits to growth, and so on. I'm not of that school of thought. Um, and certainly, I think there are some choices to, made, to be made, and po democratic politics needs to fight those out and make those imperfectly. What does the developing world need? The developing world needs more growth, more effective markets, and we certainly, well, we're gonna eat your lunch quite soon, but we don't want you to stop growing either. So I don't think you can think of, well, have we got enough in the West and so on. These are very, um, you know, economic growth doesn't work like, gee, you know, we've got enough, I think we'll stagnate for a while. It doesn't work that way. Look what's happening in the West. And you're either going up or you're going down. I think it's a, See some crazy ideas floating around, quite frankly, and I just think I'm in favor of economic growth. I have faith in innovation and technology. This doesn't mean we're gonna solve everything. I don't think scientists know it all, and uh, I think that we're, I'm not in favor of this okay. kind of intervention. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed the talks, got a lot out of them, but I was really struck by one thing, which was a, to my mind, enormous gap which was the explicit mention of power. Um, we heard about accountability me mechanisms, which are part of which is to challenge power. We heard about access to venture capital, which is in parts about challenging power. We heard about more companies, which is about oligopoly. So it was there, but it isn't brought out. Uh, Sabina mentioned empowerment, and in a similar way to how Sen does it, it's power to do something. So incidentally, it gets mentioned when it's just delicately about a little bit more power for the disempowered people. But surely, at center stage here, is ways in which we can break down the concentrations of power on the part of the most powerful figures. And I think that lies behind so much of what's been said. Why is it not there? Is it an etiquette? We don't want to offend powerful interests? Okay. Or is it um, a, a bit old-fashioned, too clumsy? Why is this not far more prominent in our discussion? Uh, so far, the panel's focused very strongly on economic growth uh, to raise living standards and so on. But I'd just like to point out that economic growth has occurred where all, m all or almost most of the money goes to the rich in the country and not the poor. And I'd just like to see what the view of the pandas on wealth distribution and whether Western countries should focus on changing policies in developing countries to ensure more redistribution in terms of wealth. So, the wealth that's already there will go to the poorer people and they can maybe make a greater contribution. Okay, to thank you. I just wondered in terms of how you see development generally, uh, because uh, with the way that it was being phrased by both Sabina and, uh, and Stuart, there's a sort of an inversion of development as we might uh, historically have seen it, where, I mean, almost noble savagery, where effectively you can be poor but rich in resources, in well-being, and, and all the rest of it. And yet, some of those material factors uh, of, of development, uh, the ability to survive in a harsh uh, reality, might be kind of being downplayed. So, you know, Bhutan may be kind of have great happiness, but not much else in, in many, uh, in many uh, ways. So I just want to see how you kind of look at the inversion of development and what implications that has for seeing ourselves and seeing development per se, material development as being problematic. And then for the, for the other side, uh, Anil and, uh, and Anne, uh, again, there was a, 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 a um, similarity towards the end in what you said, Anne, when you mentioned the demographic dividend in India, which, you know, in, in one respect, yes, is a kind of positive dynamic for economic growth, but it's premised on the fact there's lots of young, cheap labor uh, rather than necessarily developing the productive forces where maybe you wouldn't need so many people as it happens to kind of raise the economic w uh, wealth and that ties in with Anil because I just think again there's a, there's a danger of like reinventing the wheel and using poor people to come up with those kind of very basic innovations which actually people around the world may have come up with better solutions quicker and may already exist, and we've almost given up on demanding those, and we're going back to maybe just kind of reinventing uh, what's already there. Thanks. Let me talk about the idea of inequality. I think people throw this around very loosely, and this is a big mistake. I have a lot less money than the Queen of England. This doesn't make me sit up at night and worry. Relative deprivation isn't the issue. The issue is inequality of opportunities, in my view. 
And I will fight very hard for people to have more and more and more opportunities, better education, better health, a whole roads to markets and so on and so forth. That's much more important than inequality. So yes, inequality is a reality, it's not ideal, but actually the best way of dealing with that is economic growth. And the people who are saying that trickle down doesn't work and the poor keep getting poor, the, the evidence of the last 30 years disputes this. This is no longer a debate, there are facts. So I just think that argument's gone now. When I talked about violence as a vote of the people who are disadvantaged in the most marginal regions of the country, I was talking about power. And my contention was that this power imbalance which exists is by itself not very bad because without imbalance, the energy doesn't flow. So we all know that some imbalance in the power will always remain for institutions to operate and mediate. But we must recognize that this mediation by either voluntary organizations or by the other civil society actors leaves a lot of scope for state to be indifferent and state to be in some sense impervious to the feedback. We should not give license to the state to only worry about the large sector and leave the rest for the voluntary organizations and others. Number two, there is a recent move that 30% equity in the mining companies will be owned by the tribals who live in those regions from where mining is done. This is a radical move. It has never been thought about anywhere in the world that 30% equity, Australia will not give, Canada will not give, many other countries will not give, but in India this is a move now on the statues. Third, the whole issue of rediscovery of the wheel. I don't know how many of you have an option of a car with a, a black box, or for that matter, a pollution control device which captures one kilogram of carbon per 12 horsepower a month. There are a whole range of innovation. A crutch with a shock absorber. I have not seen in England any crutch with a shock absorber, which our little girl in Assam has invented. So I don't think, I think it's a sheer ignorance of the innovative potential of the masses that generates such a comment. I respect that comment, but I would request you to look, pick up a CD and a copy of Honeybee and okay. look for yourself what great variety of innovations people are producing, which will help not just the developing countries, but also humanize the life of the people in the developed countries. Thank you. The gent here at the front in the striped shirt said, um, you know, were, were we being a bit squeamish and we didn't want to offend anyone by, by talking about power? So let's do that. One of the kind of enduring kind of myths, it's a kind of absolutely bizarre kind of fantasy of the beyond GDP mob, um, is that somehow they're outsiders. Hang on. Prince Charles, Nicolas Sarkozy, all these noble laureates, Secretary General of this, Secretary General of that, European Commissioner of that, David Cameron, are these people really outsiders? They're not, they're the establishment. They are the people who hold power. They are the people who actually often for ill do shape the world um, in which we live in, in their interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, not least. Their beliefs, their values of community capital, their valuation of slum life actually stands in the way of implementing the principles of equality or progress that I talked about that have over generations been proven to make people's lives better. That's history. So if you want to challenge power, then let's start challenging some of these values, these rethinks, these new ways of looking at the world that aren't coming from outsiders. They're not coming from slum dwellers. They're not coming from poor women carrying pots of water on their head. They are coming from the great and good, the people who wield power often for ill in this world. I think what I'd like to start off by talking about is my own view of development, because I think it's so easy to get characterized into one school or another. I've fought a lot of my life, and I'll carry on fighting, for economic and social rights for every single human being on that planet. And that means sufficient education, it means sufficient health, access to jobs. Those things were spelt out in the International Declaration of Human Rights, and too much of the world has ignored them. They've done some focus on civil and political rights. They've ignored economic and social rights. Every single person on this planet should have enough of those basic things that make life worthwhile. Let's be really clear. We start with the material base. And I certainly wouldn't go for any airy-fairy stuff at the expense of that. So that's, I think it's so important to start there. The second thing to say is 
people like myself, I'm, I wouldn't put myself in Bruno's category, but the, our organization isn't fighting economic growth per se. What we're saying is, first of all, everybody should have economic and social rights in the world. Secondly, we should be aiming to, for our economic system to increase well-being, to decrease inequality and poverty, and to do so within planetary limits. And that means not forgetting employment, it means everybody needs enough jobs. And the issue is then how you do it, because on the one hand, carrying on, given what we know about ecological limits to the planet, seems impossible, even if you take big technological assumptions about how we, you know, I'm terribly pro-technological change in business, even if you take those into account, we still got a problem. So it seems impossible, but we've actually got to carry on creating enough jobs and improving well-being without breaking those planetary limits. That's the task for us, and it does require people in the South having access to air travel and things like that. So we've got to rethink the thing, and that can be done by absolutely what Sabina was saying, deciding where we want to go. Yes, uh, three things came my way, power, growth, and aspirations, and should poverty be narrower than well-being? Power. From the period when free market economics arose, uh, socialists were in power and people who took a free market view could not get jobs, they could not be published in central journals, they were scoffed at and thought of as uh, not serious. We studied how they organized. So rather than talking about power, we're trying to find the strategy that will work in a different globalized era with the internet and, internet and Bretton Woods institutions. We've written it up, Winning Ideas is a working paper which forms our strategy. Second, growth. Yes, the data are in. India has grown strongly since it liberalized in 1991. 1995 and 6, 47% of children under three were malnourished. 2005, 2006, that had decreased to 46%. Uh, similarly, in the countries that were studied by the Growth Commission, having had 25 years of high growth, these included Botswana, in which 30% of children remain malnourished, and Indonesia, where 28% of people remain malnourished. So growth does not affect other desirable and basic human ends. A group of European economists have found little or no correlation between economic growth and any non-income MDGs. Therefore, growth is good, but it will not address other things as basic as malnutrition, education, water, and sanitation, unless it is complemented by deliberate social policy. And also, low-income countries, in terms of NGO work, can address acute poverty. In our study of multidimensional poverty, we found Uzbekistan has low income, but only 2% of its people ex experience extreme poverty. So it's very possible to, to rid these grievous uh, okay. deprivations. Well, if Anne Bernstein wants to stand as president of South Africa, she'll have my vote <laughs> um, as a South African. Not because I'm an entrepreneur or capitalist, but I just loved her go out and get it, grow the economy, and let's start solving some of the problems. But South Africa is an excellent example, actually, of the dilemmas that have been posed from the platform. Because the ANC government, in fact, has very wholeheartedly adopted the Millennium Development Goals. Right, right, right from the start, it's, it's said that that... And those goals sort of lower the horizon. It's not a matter of economic growth or of improving the living standards of all of the people in South Africa. It's directed very, very narrowly at the most impoverished people um, in the society, right? That's, that's where a lot of the attention has gone and a lot of the po social policies have gone um, in South Africa. And indeed, they have made some inroads there. They have lifted people off the very lowest rungs of poverty, um, you know, by a substantial percentage. They have, in fact, extended social policies to them, free water, free electricity, and so forth. But for the vast majority of South Africans, there have been no substantial improvements in their living standards. Unemployment, right, sits at officially 25%, most people estimate Quick, it's a quickly. third of the population. So there's a country, right, who's applying the Millennium Development Goals and not achieving anything like 
the economic growth and success of China or Brazil. There seems an incredible rewriting of history going on here from Bruno and Anne. Um, capitalism in its first incarnation led to Dickensian London. It didn't lead to health and prosperity and wealth for all. It led to the exploitation of children, women, and workers. The trade union movement and various socialist movements then challenged those views, and the, and the, uh, the articulation of capitalism was so unjust and so brutal and cruel that they had some moral weight. And changes were brought about, and through the actions of socialists, Working hours were changed, pay conditions, and healthy and safe working environments were created. It wasn't capitalism that brought about that, it was capitalism in reaction to moral, political, and social views. What now has happened is that Dickensian London has been exported to the third world, and we are now exploiting third world workers in exactly the same way. And for Anne to suggest that there is no choice other than for these women to work at below minimum wages uh, is an extraordinary Malthusian argument that was being used in exactly the same way in the early 19th century, that we couldn't give workers power, we couldn't challenge uh, capitalism, because if we did challenge capitalism, the choice was nothing. So they would starve to death if they weren't but that's not what happened. In the West, what happened was okay, that quick, capitalism quick, quick, became more just and it reacted to the moral values. Stuart, you've just emphasized that you are in favor of material development and economic growth. Let's just take us back to the very first comment from the panel, which was your comment about the fact that we're running out of the planet. And I, I'm sure, Stuart, you'll agree this is hardly a new economic thought. In fact, it's a, a very, very old economic thought. Uh, you quoted Adam Smith, but let's go back to one of uh, another classical economist, uh, the Reverend Thomas Malthus, who also argued very consistently and coherently that we are running out of planet. Uh, he said that there was too many people being born, the uh, society was growing too fast, and there wasn't enough land, there wasn't enough planet to be able to produce enough. How was Malthus' thesis, his dismal prognosis disproved? It wasn't through restricting consumption. It wasn't through restricting population. It was through increased productivity, which by and by is uh, rising GDP per employee and expresses itself in rising GDP per capita. Rising productivity, increased production is the way to solve the problems which have been articulated. And the sad fact is, though, that rising productivity is not a given. Economic growth is not a given. And as far as I can see, the biggest constraint on rising productivity, which can solve many of these problems of poverty and inequality, the biggest constraint at the moment is precisely the cultural idea that economic growth has limits. It's precisely the mainstream hold of the ideas that it is irresponsible to challenge economic, social, moral, environmental limits to growth. So the sad irony, Stuart, is that Actually, you are articulating ideas which are standing in the way of actually resolving some of the problems which you're highlighting. Hey, thanks a lot for your entertainment that you provided with a very romantic notion that poor people have brains and they can also survive against all odds. We know human beings survive against all odds. But the question with all this poverty over here is structural. I'm just finishing with one single line when I say structural. In Delhi, there have been seven new five-star hotels built in the last five years. And some $16 billion have been spent on provide, creating bridges and sports stadiums. Who's using them? If you travel only 100 miles to either direction of Delhi, put Delhi as a circle, travel 100 miles in any direction, you can understand that the infrastructure in rural villages, talk about water. You talk about water, do you know in villages, houses do not have taps. There is only one single municipal tap on a street which every village goes there to just get one pot of drinkable water. That's the India we are talking about. Okay, so the issue is structural. If, if we had 15 planets, we'd have too much water, we'd all drown. You know, we, we have got a shortage of water. You know, I think Q8 gets all its water from desalination plants. You know, the, the problem is clearly economic. Um, in the 1980s, the World Bank stopped uh, lending uh, fir third world countries loans to build dams. Um, and it began building wells instead, which 
groups like UNICEF had done in the, in the 70s. Now, what's interesting, in, in the 90s, uh, what was seen as a resource, it was an economic constraint in the 80s, was reinterpreted in the 90s as um, an empowerment initiative. So these wells were, were, not only were they not actually dug any longer by the government, but pe the communities were encouraged to dig their own wells. And that was seen as empowering okay, because it perfect. was, Why they not? were, you know, so I just, just, just that tendency to see a lack of, uh, you know, uh, development as a, as a social justice or empowerment issue. I just wanted to take issue with um, Bruno's kind of equating of the pro-slum discourse with an anti-growth discourse. And I think it's unfair to pick Prince Charles as the, the leading voice on that side as well. I mean, my reading of that has been much more that it's been a recognition that urbanization is good, urbanization leads to growth, and people moving from rural areas to the slums are given access to energy, access to telecoms, access to education, access to entrepreneurship, and women are given opportunities and are able to have fatherless children as well. Um, so I just thought that the, the slum talk that had gone on so far was, was slightly unbalanced. For me, I think that, if anything, we can kind of have feel relatively sure that we've demonstrated that there is a problem with talking about justice today, that we're not good about making judgments uh, that we've had, and argue very um, persuasively for growth is good, and Sabina respond by saying growth is good, uh, but, uh, and that we have uh, an inability maybe to agree on that, which we need to get uh, much, much better at, and hopefully we can continue that in the discussion. It was Oyston Dahl, who was an ex- senior executive of ExxonMobil, who said fairly recently, communism collapsed because it didn't allow prices to tell the economic truth. Capitalism will collapse because it doesn't allow prices to tell the ecological truth. And we have got to wake up. The species on Earth are threatened, that's the latest. We are facing serious climate change, and not to address the economics of fairness in there. And I will have that debate, you know, I would be terribly pro-business, but it's got to be in a context exactly where power distribution is, is addressed. It's got to be in a context where carbon prices aren't 12 pounds a tonne, but something like 80 pounds a tonne. Put the right prices in and address excess monopoly, then we might be talking something sensible. Well, I would first uh, mention one small policy example from India which could be useful for South Africa. In South Africa today, it is banned, it is illegal to vend uh, on the roadside. You, might, you can drive for miles and you wouldn't find a workshop or a small mechanic shop. Unleash the power of people to fabricate, people to repair, people to solve things, and you generate jobs immediately and create a skill ladder for people to move from road, roadside shack to shop to workshop to factory to mill. This, this ladder is available in India with all its limitations for people to move up eventually. But this ladder is not available in a large number of countries, particularly South Africa. Second thing I would say is that the greatest choice which we have today to empower people and generate justice, to me, is to pay attention to the diversity of skills that people have and creating an environment, conducive environment, favorable environment, a compassionate environment, which will help these skills to flourish and generate solutions within the limits, of course, of nature. And I completely agree mm -hmm. that if the ecological truth is one thing which will, be, will, which, which will definitely lead to the collapse of capitalism. If, we don't pay attention to that. I agree with um, Phil at the back that Malthusianism, um, like the poor, always seems to be um, with us. I just want to make, just to, to end with a, a kind of final plea that, that, that really it's politics, not justice. It's about, should be about, um, challenging the world um, rather than um, seeking fairness um, or, or, or value um, within it. I mean, justice, like growth, may sometimes be necessary but it's just not um, sufficient. Justice all too often is the um, arbitration of fairness by um, the people. And I think if we took that look, take that leaf out of um, George Orwell's book, um, then we can start listening, looking for um, a different kind of politics, a new politics that can um, challenge some of the um, assumptions that are imposed on this debate. Let me make two points about power and politics and capitalism. I am in favor of domestic politics. I want people to have rights to organize, to change the law, to do all sorts of things in a democratic debate. I'm not 
that's a very different thing from NGO advocacy organizations, a few people in rich countries telling the third world or developing countries what to do. Now, the best form of taming capitalism is to have competitive capitalism. You want competition, you want fair rules of the game, I'm 100% in favor of that. And then I'm 100% in favor of workers, as we're seeing in China today, organizing for better conditions, better wages, but it's domestic politics, and that's, I would be in favor of that. My last point is, perhaps this hasn't reached South Africa yet, but is there a global migration to Bhutan? If everybody's so happy there, <laughs> what's going on? Um, I haven't heard of this. Economics is poised to change. In a decade, it will be different. Darren Esamoglu, a Harvard economist, spoke of the recent crisis and said, we, economists, let policymakers' rhetoric set the agenda for our thinking and for our policy advice. Nick Stern, LSE professor, in his presidential address to the European Economic Society, said that whereas Keynes had spoken of politicians as slaves of defunct economists, he thought that now economists had become slaves of defunct politicians. So there is an opening, and I would ask a group like this to continue the debate, to continue calling for economic ideas that take into account climate and well-being, because perhaps it could be different. Thank you. Can we thank our panel.